So well, welcome everybody. Yeah, welcome everybody. My name is Sean Bosch. I'm a program manager with professional continuing studies here at the School of Continuing Ed. I'm joined today by Marta Munez, who's an instructor with, with the school. Um, and she's going to speak about the power of your vote today. Um, so before we get started, I'll just do a quick land acknowledgement here. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that the land in which we gather in Treaty 6 territory is a traditional gathering place for many Indigenous people. We honour and respect the history, languages, ceremonies and culture of First Nation, Métis and Inuit who call this territory home. So today's speaker, Marta Munez. Marta is an instructor with McEwen University School of Continuing Education, working specifically with international students in teaching Canadian workplace culture, intercultural communications, and fundamentals of public speaking. She has also taught geopolitics internationally, and her expertise is in municipal elections and sustainable city initiatives. Marta also holds a master's degree in political science from the University of Alberta, with a specialization in United States politics. Marta, we're super excited to have you with us, and I know this is a very exciting topic, especially right now with all of the um, all of the signs and elections that are going on seemingly all at once. So um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll hand it off to you. Oh, actually, we'll go through some quick housekeeping before we, we move on. <laughs> um, so please keep your microphone muted and your video off. I think that's the default already. So we, I don't think you'll need to worry about that. Um, we'll take questions at the end, but if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in the chat and um, we can deal with them as they come in and we will do some discussion at the end as well. Um, and also, like I had already mentioned, the session's being recorded and a link of it will be sent out to you after, after the session is done. So with that, I'll hand it off to Marta. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much for being here and that kind introduction. Thank you to the university, my Pion University, for creating these spaces for all of us to communicate and be together, talking about issues that are, affect our lives. And also, thank you to all of you who have joined us today. Um, I don't know if Sean at the end wants to share why well, we need more um, filtering in our invitations, but thank you all of you who are here. So I am passionate about politics, just a word, and everything that entails. However, I am particularly passionate about the power that we have in our hands when we vote. And I've been doing this for 25, 30 years, making sure when there is an election, people understand that they have to go to the polls and put their ballot inside. So today, let me start this presentation with the story. It is Halloween of 1995, October 31st. I am leaving Colombia with 20 Canadian consultants who have been with me supporting an initiative with the Ministry of Energy. It's 6 a.m. of this 31st of October, 1995, and the airport where we are waiting for the gate to open and enter the plane is just buzzing with conversation. We just can't stop. In the plane on the ride to Toronto, the same. And when we landed in Toronto, it was a screaming um, TV screens all over the airport. Canada had won over the Quebec referendum to leave Canada. The no saying don't leave Canada had won over the yes of Quebecers who wanted to leave Canada. The, the country kept staying back. Great political news after, of course, everything that happened before, during, and after this event. But that's not why I wanted to tell you this one. Do you know what the result was? 50, oh, I don't think you can see it properly. 50.6% for the no, can evict states. 50.6%. They only needed 50% to leave. 
the yes, the yes got 49.4. Imagine the slim marginal votes. The left, that important piece of our country, Quebec, part of our country. That happened 26 years ago, 26. Quebec has been part of Canada. We have Quebec with us. We're so proud to have this amazing country together. The reason why I invoke this story is because that's what the part of vote is. Sometimes the margin of one vote, one vote. I will be presenting some stories during, during my presentation. But the most important thing I want to tell you is this one. I know you know, I know you have voted before, and I'm sure you voted this week. We are in a political mood in Canada and in Alberta, double, because you know we have elections, another election coming up. My inspiration for you and for me, my, for myself, never miss the opportunity to vote, never miss an election. Your vote is so powerful. It's so powerful, your vote, that that's what the politicians want. Because my power is transferred to them when they are elected. Our power, all our votes together, they make that official in any of the three levels of government, federal, provincial, or municipal, have a chance to implement ideas, beliefs, values, programs that we want for our community, for our land and the people in it. And we give them that power with the vote. I just want to share with you my screen to show you one of the many pictures I had to show you. And of course, it's this little one, right? The simplicity of putting a piece of paper inside a box, sometimes electronic, sometimes just a piece of paper. The many things you know that happen around it. Ah, I don't even want to use those words. This is not our concern today. When people are not happy with the result or when really in some places in the world, they interfere with the freedom of the vote. But that's not our point or my point with you. My point is, oh, let's awake to the power we have in our hands. It is our power that makes them powerful. And that's why they are after our vote in any way possible. Before we go, I just wanted to show you the story about Quebec, right? October 30 was the referendum. Quebec wanted to separate from Canada and form an independent country. And the votes were, no, Quebec stays 50.6%. And 49.4 for the yes, they couldn't separate. Quebec is still part of the country and that happened 26 years ago. That is the second point of my presentation. So my agenda for you today, and thank you again for being here, is that first, that part of your body, something you have to know, you have to be aware of it. Be proud. Uh, intelligent about it, be sure that when you give it, it's a precious thing you're giving away. In my particular case, I remember voting clearly for the person I wanted. I just went to the polls directly, name, check, gone. Many times I changed my vote at the last minute. And that is freedom of choice. And sometimes I was disappointed later who the person I, I elected. That's also part of it. Okay. The second part I want to present to you is that when we elect them with our vote, 
it's a temporal thing. It's not forever, even though sometimes it happens. Like we in our election, in our federal election today, or yes, of this week, two days ago, our prime minister is having the third period. Three consecutive elections. Wow. And then when we elect them, even though they may live, may live in three years or in four, or sometimes in days or weeks, what they do is forever, is the effect of voting is long-term. Again, I'm going back to the Quebec referendum. That was 26 years ago, 26. Long-term effect. And even now, I don't think, even though there's still, you know, strong opinions in Quebec and that's part of the democracy of a country, I don't think they are really, really going to leave us or leave it, leave the country, not us, leave their place. And the third thing, which is the main objective of our meeting is the municipal elections, because I love cities. I love mayors. I want you to end with me after this hour, you can have your food if you want to. Understanding the incredible uh, task, the responsibility of being a mayor. And when we elect him or her, it's a very transcendental decision because cities are our closest piece of government. I don't think I've ever seen uh, Justin Trudeau service close to me. Maybe I saw some of the others in the past. I have not seen the premier of my province like having a coffee or talking. But I have been with the mayor of Edmonton. I have introduced him once or twice to his participation in an event I was part of. He recognizes me by name and I say, hello, Mr. Mayor. The election of a mayor is the closest to us, also the closest to our children, our family, our schools, universities. I could talk five hours or 10 <laughs> because I have been around the world learning about the importance of cities and how the CEO of a city is the mayor. He's also the chair of the council. What a power. So let's elect a mayor that has the, the view of giving us all we need. So that's the presentation today. We already began about the power of vote. And let me add again, voting is about power. It's not about climate change, environmental protection, more schools, attention to the uh, homeless, affordable housing, COVID-19, mask or no mask. Those are issues, yes. But everything about elections and the vote is about power. And we have it. And we transfer it at the time of voting. So if all of us understood that, we give that vote with careful def definition of what is it that we're looking for. All right. And then the last point, I already said this, is that politics is an agreement. It's an agreement to live in one particular place together knowing for sure the rules of the stay together, what is Quebec, what is Alberta, what is Edmonton, what is Calgary, foreign policy, how do we relate to the rest of the world, to the other countries? How do we let people in to be also part of our country? Let me just add, because the story about Quebec is very beautiful. That time, at that time, October 31st, 1995, 
I could not vote because I was not a Canadian citizen at the time. I had been in Canada for two and a half years. Landed immigrant with all the legalities, with my three children and my husband. But I was not authorized to vote in a federal election or for this matter in, in this referendum. That is another point. The value of being a citizen and having the chance to vote for that person you want. And that's also the power of the vote. In our family for this election, we had two incredible examples. One, my granddaughter who became of age and she could vote, 18 years old. She was a citizen because she was, and these are the four words, she was born here. And another person who became a citizen had been living in Canada for four or five years, did all the process, and now she is a citizen. And she also voted in, in this election. First time in their lives. Okay, again, it's all about power. The issues come after. Now, one of the things I want to share with you, and let me just go back to the slides for a second. Is that when we elect them, when we elect our um, representatives and we transfer the power and they are in charge, and I, I love this image that I'm going to show you right away, it's my vote that made them powerful. And they are not responsible to their party, they are responsible to me. <laughs> and that's something that of course, uh, in the passing of time, we understand. If anybody has a question here, you're welcome. Anybody has a question, you can type on the chat. I'll give you a, a few seconds, otherwise we'll continue. Sean, any questions right now? No? No, it doesn't look like any questions yet. Okay, very good. And to close this part, there are many ways to be engaged in the democracy of your country. But nothing compares to voting. And of course, running for office. And of course, helping other people also vote. But nothing compares to my vote. All right. The second part is that elections are temporal and its effects are long term. And I want to be aware of time. All right. We are doing great. So here is this person, this young man from Canada who was re-elected for the third time to run the government. He will have another three or four years of power, but he's not gonna live there forever. In the future, we will have other prime ministers, but whatever he decides to do is going to be forever, or sometimes. But look at this, and, and I love this statistic. You know how long he had been in power? I wanted to surprise you, but I, I had it there already. And he has been in power for five years and 322 days, the day of the election. How many things you do in five years and a half, or almost six years? Every day making decisions for the millions of Canadians that live here. The importance of the vote that he got the first time that put him in office and now he is in office, right? For five consecutive years. And, and I'll finish this part, which is wonderful, about the longest serving prime ministers in Canada. Look at this number. William Mackenzie was prime minister for 21 years and 154 days. When he was elected, imagine the first time he got the votes and then continue to get the vote. In his case, it wasn't continuously. And there were um, gaps in between, but 
in power. John McDonald, 18 years in power, that's 359 days. Wow, 18 years. <laughs> My granddaughter is 18 years old. That's a lifetime. And Pierre Trudeau, father of our current prime minister, he was in power 15 years and 164 days. So what do I mean again with this? It's a big, big power we have in our hands. They are not appointed. Somebody doesn't come and says, oh, Marta, tomorrow you're going to be prime minister of Canada. No. I have to run a campaign. I have to invite people to hear me. I have to inspire them and, and motivate them to vote for me. One of the best things of the last days of elections, and I invite you to do it with all your heart, believe me, is that comments, that commentaries about who won, who, who won and who lost. What happened? And you say, what? The perception of society for that person was changed in the process how they didn't vote or they did vote. As you see, the only person I have mentioned here is the prime minister because he was elected two days ago. In this amazing space that McKeown University has created, we are not promoting any name or any campaign or anything of the kind. We love everybody. I am a professor at university. I love my students and we love politics in every class, but never party politics. We talk about politics, the big beautiful world, which is the agreement between people of a land to live together. <laughs> All right. So now let me um, share again. Marta, there's a there's a, a few questions here in the in the chat. Okay. I don't know if Go you ahead. want to get to them before sure. you move on. Um, I love Mil that. Yeah. Okay. Mildred had I a few comments can't... and questions here. So he mm. said, "You say it is important to vote, but I'm waiting to hear about first becoming informed about the character and ide ideology of the person you are voting for. Otherwise, you're simply gambling that you are voting yes. for someone who truly represents you." And okay, he, very he good. also went he also went on to say, "What do I stand for?" What do I want to see in my city? What are the things of mine that will be supported by the mayor and councillors that I vote for? Are lower property taxes right. important or is it important that roads are plowed, that potholes are fixed in a timely fashion? Who do I want to give that power to? Sometimes the personal character can be determined by checking social media, and Googling the name of your selected candidate, being aware of the person you're empowering. With big power comes big responsibility. I think those are wonderful right. comments, yes. Excellent. Mildred, you, you got it. You are seeing with clarity that when you are going to give that power, you have to know who to give it to. And that is a job that sometimes is difficult to really count on because politicians, campaigns, and everything about inviting, even advertising for buying a car, um, going to a certain university is moved by emotions. And sometimes we want a particular person to be the candidate because he talked to our heart. But we really have to do the homework. And I, I every line you wrote, Mildred, is perfect. What do I want? What do I want? Sometimes we vote for the party and many times we vote for the person and there are people who really got it and work for the program what is the offer and also something important Mildred and all of you if you voted for someone and that person didn't do what he promised don't vote for him again and it's sometimes it's unbelievable that people are re-elected even though they didn't do a good job. But it's not unbelievable because of course, again, it's a practice of power. And some people know how to do that. All right, to continue. There's another question here, Marta. Go ahead. 
Um, uh, Lucy, Lucy wanted to ask you, how does it work when we vote? It is decided before the West votes. Say it again. How does it work that when we vote, it is decided before the West votes? <laughs> so I think the question uh, she's just me? asking there is sort of how Time. the, um, yeah, the timing of the, um, of how different um, places are calling the election sort of before all the votes are, votes are tallied. Yeah. And I think that's that just, you know, with the, the seat system and the, and, and the, the minimum required yeah. for a majority and a minority. Yeah, that is a very big, big question. And I, I wish I had a perfect answer. I don't, but, but I understand what happens. You know, um, one of the things that I am planning to do and it's been on the make for a few, I say a couple of years, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to have a podcast on elections that are happening at the same time every day in the world. And I invite you to go and, and, and click Elections, elections happening in the world, in Google. 25, 30, 40, 50, for president, for parliament, for city, for mayors. Every day there are elections in the world. And you know, we hear the same, kind of the same uh, complaint in many places. How come you close the voting two hours before me, which impacts the way that I'm going to vote. Even in this last election, one person on in the news, I was following, of course, two or three channels at the same time, making sure I got how people were responding. And someone said, hey, no, BC, because you haven't voted, look what's happening here. And someone stopped him and said, you cannot do that in this place. But I agree. Let me just close with something because I don't have the answer for that, but I know every country has issues like that. But the only thing I can tell you is that the electoral system is complicated. And in many ways, doesn't respect the rights of the voter in many places and circumstances. Sometimes, you know, and I don't want, to, again, I said, I don't want to say anything negative here. I want to just concentrate on the power we have in our hands. Like when we have a Ferrari and we can drive 240 kilometers per hour and there's no police around, we're gonna just have fun. But it's not that easy. Interference with the right and the freedom of vote and the confidentiality of voting is broken in many places, in many places. And we hear about I, the word I didn't want to say, right? But thank you for that question because it's impossible to stop it. I mean, maybe not impossible, but especially in a country this size, right? Canada goes from the Pacific to the Atlantic and the time in every place is really one of, one of the issues. Okay, so now I hope, did I answer your question? Did I give you an answer that you are okay with? All right, we'll see. Okay, and that brings us to the main issue that is coming up, which is electing a mayor. And I think we're going to, to also have a good opportunity here to say what goes wrong and what goes right. So the third point in the presentation today, again, I thank McEwen University and you for being here, is that the world transformed completely in 50 years. Five zero. And I'm going to be very honest with this. In 50 years, well, 50 years, or maybe now around 60, the population of the world lived 30% in urban centers and 70% in the rural land. And then something happened, which experts around the world, and I've been part of that research, 
still can't really pinpoint because in the 1960s, 70s, everybody left the rural land and came to live in cities. And the cities have been growing and growing and growing unprecedentedly and it's not reversing. This is not going back. So from our 7 billion plus people in the planet, around 60% live in an urban center. New York, Chicago, Toronto, Albert, Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, Hong Kong, Milan, London. I'm just talking about the big ones, Cairo. I have been in many of those cities and it's impossible to imagine that you can be mayor of a city like that. I have a picture of all the many I have, but I said, I think this will give him an idea. And let me show you what I have. I won't anticipate the, the name of the city, but I'm going to go down and show you. Uh, let me see if I have it here. There you go. Slip it down. This city is Hong Kong. Uh, what did I do? Hong Kong, right? And Look at the size of the buildings, the houses. It's a city that is completely up high with amazing bay in front of them. Prosperous center of the Asian, Southeast Asia and the Chinese and the Indian and everything that has to happen in the geopolitics. When I was flying over, leaving from Seoul, I think, and we were going down to Singapore and then over Hong Kong. And you cannot believe what you see from the air. So the cities now are big, even in Canadian terms. Our cities are regular, you know, really small. Edmonton doesn't have a million people yet, like officially a million people. One million people is a medium-sized city for the rest of the world. And I love to play with friends. I even did it to Sean when we talked last week. Do you know how many people live in Hong Kong? I mean, in, in Cairo, the capital of Egypt? Almost 40 million. How many people live in Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina? Almost the same number that New York. And you are surprised when you hear those things, right? Okay, so back. So now we're going to elect mayors and how do we do that? It's probably the most important vote that we should have because it's the one close to our children. Do we want a bicycle line or not? Do you want mask mandates or no? That is infringing. Do you, um, you know, create more schools, etc. So let me just go back uh, down. So we have now the municipal elections, and I just said this about the population of the world: four point two billion live in cities, and we like those mayors, people elect those mayors. Hong Kong, you saw that. And this is what we really want. I, I like to brag a little bit with you. This is the only moment what I really want to say that I am very, very proud, um, thankful of the work I've been doing for 15 years with the UN in something called UN Habitat. UN Habitat, has, um, I don't know, 150,000 consultants around the world. And they are studying the process of cities to help because some cities are dying. Some cities have poverty, drug problems, 
uh, homelessness, uh, incapacity to study, people from different places who don't have even an immigration status. And they have the commitment to help the cities get up again, get out of that state because it's for the people. So in Quito, Ecuador, um, about five years ago, 190 countries of the world signed an agreement called the New Urban Agenda. And we have traveled every two years around the world. I just invited Sean to join me because he also likes urban uh, development. And we see how easy it could be, but how difficult it is to really create resilient cities. One of the things, for example, about <laughs> politics, really, who wants to be mayor, governor, premier, prime minister during COVID? I admire the doctors, the nurses, the scientists, and the government people who have done good. Some have been indifferent and they may pay the price, but we pay the price. Deciding what to do in a pandemic. Wow, what a big work for the mayor of a city. So well-planned, managed, and financed cities and towns create value that builds resilient cities. We can bounce back, for example, in this case, from the Devastate, devastating impact of pandemics, improve the quality of life of, of our residents and stand in the fight. Fight, because there is also competition, competition in the world for money. So just to show you uh, for a moment, Alberta goes into elections October 18. This is our large and beautiful province. If we have people from other provinces, welcome, you know, to, to, uh, to follow up what we have here. This one is my love card for the mayors. Really, I've seen mayors all over the world, and it's an amazing job. I, it's incredible that they run for that position. They are the chief executive of the city and chair of council. There are stories, and I, I think I could because now we're getting close to the end, right? I just want to add a few examples. First of all, we have elections, but guess what? We also have a referendum. We have a referendum in Alberta. When we vote for the mayor in a few weeks, we also have two questions to respond. One is, do you, Albertan want the equalization program to continue. And I know you know, but let's just have a couple of sentences. And do you want ha to have a straight time during the year so we don't have to fall back or spring forward? Look at the things that you have to ask the citizens of a city. Of a, in this case, a, a province. So equalization is, uh, here we have a country that receives money from everywhere and then distributes where it's needed. But sometimes, you know, some provinces receive more even though they did less and some provinces work a lot, given all their money and then don't receive the same amount. So equalization is an issue, especially in the West part of Canada where we are. So we're going to respond to that, Albertans. If we say yes, we want equalization to be reviewed, then our premier will invite other provinces to join in a review of that legislation, which is federal. And the other one about daylight saving time is because it's complicated. And even though there's science about that, our in and out, we want to have Forget about those issues. We have that referendum coming up in the same boat where we're going to elect our mayor. So before I, because this will be the end and I want to hear a story from you. Um, 
I mean, before that. So what is it that we want? See, we have problems and we have issues. But hey, all of a sudden comes a leader and changes everything. And we get a solution. And then we get the solution too. Oh, he did this and it's unnecessary, creating many problems in the city, expensive. But hey, let's select a new person that will do a different thing than he that than the previous mayor has done, or counselors, because every counselor is going to be a mini mayor. They will decide everything with the mayor. And they represent our writing, our word, those beautiful indigenous names that we're going to start using now. And now that we have the day coming for truth and reconciliation and national day, wow, was uh, Edmonton ahead. Having the words of the city with, with sounds that completely we don't get. I hope one day I can pronounce properly because I love languages. I speak Spanish, English, and a better French. I can't wait to pronounce the name of those words properly. So now that we are here about to elect, let me show you the last image I want to leave with you. Even though we still may have some time for questions and answers or more. Many people don't vote. I'd like to ask you, why do you think some people don't go, don't vote? Is there anybody who has an answer to that? Or a question about a question about that. In this graphic, that I thought it was perfect to close our lunch time and this conversation about the power of our vote that we transfer to the elected official so he can do what I want, what we want. Enough for him to make money for his packet. It's not for him to work in you know, in alliance with others against my, my decision. That's what politics is complicated sometimes. But it's beautiful though. It's really humans making an agreement to live together. And it's been forever like that. When we began to communicate and have language and live together in a place, we decided who's going to do what, where we're going to put this, how we're going to take care of the children, and the mothers, etc. So let me show you that image. And I like to hear from you. Why do people stay home? Let's imagine that it's possible to vote, and they didn't. But some people may have difficult, right? But for example, in this um, image, let me go back down. There you go. I don't know if you can see it well, but I'll explain a bit. The red uh, column of the chart are the federal elections, the results of the federal election. The green are the results of the provincial elections. This is Edmonton, our city here, where I am. This is the, we can do the same about every city or about the country or about a region or anywhere, but this one is about Edmonton because we have elections and I am in Edmonton. I thought I wanted to present this one. And the blue is municipal. So on the left column, which for me, the left, uh, I think is the same for you. We have from zero to 100, the percentage of people that voted. So you want to tell me something? Sorry, I just had to re-log in because I was frozen, but you're good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. That's good. So what this shows is how many people voted. But I know you know, I know we are talking about things you already know. These are people that were eligible to vote and voted. And the difference is of people who are eligible to vote, could vote but did not. So let's just look at 2019. We only had federal and provi pro provincial elections. 
and it went really well. Look, but only about 65% of votes. 65 with simple mathematics means that 35% of people did not go to vote. But look at the municipal elections, the next blue, 2017. Only 30% of people went out to vote. 70% stayed home. It's our mayor who was reelected, but it's still the election is a, is a way to tell him something. I don't like you, I love you. Yes, we are all with you. I am with you. <laughs> and so in this way to look at the elections, we can see how the municipal elections are really low. Look at the blue. From 1998, or yeah, to 2019, we have elected mayors with, like in 2007, 29 or 28 percent of the votes. The only people what stayed home watching Netflix or going to a park or said, "This is I, I don't believe it. I, I don't trust the system. Whatever." is happening, my vote will be lost or it's useless. It will never be useless. So all of you who are with me and spend this hour looking at, yeah, the planet in a way with all the big cities that are 4.8 billion people that live in them. And at the same time, our country, large and beautiful, peaceful, with legitimate elections. And then we're coming to our province. I don't know when the elections are going to come here. I think uh, that our premier had a vote of confidence two days ago. But here comes the elections of the mayor. And in Edmonton, we have had the same mayor for nine years. Or for seven years, and he has been very good. Some people will have more to say. So this is what I I want to leave you with. Democracy needs you, needs me. There are many ways I can participate in the life of my country. I can be a very good entrepreneur and create business and, and jobs. I can be an amazing employee who invents and creates more and makes the company grow. And I can be a teacher at university talking to international students who want to live in Canada and they do anything to be here. And McEwen University has a mandate, a mandate from the government of Canada to give them the opportunity to study for one year or a year and a half about how to fit into the Canadian workplace and in the Canadian culture. And that's what we do. I love every class. They are really talented. They have diplomas, university degrees, master's degrees, and they have two or three languages. Some of them have masters in mathematics and um, artificial intelligence and engineering of all kinds. And they have chosen Canada to live. That is also a way to be in democracy. But my, from my point of view, nothing compares to the power of voting. Never miss an election. It is my invitation to you. Back to you, Sean. Wonderful, thank you, Marta. I, I have a question. There's been a few comments in the chat here that, that maybe speak to that a little bit too but i know in this in, in this last federal election we saw a lot more independent candidates and there was a lot of conversation yes. of, about strategic voting what are your thoughts on that and i know that, um and, and you know how can we support independent candidates when we don't when we know they don't have the money of the party behind them um because a lot of times it just feels like we're wasting our vote but you know i, I know yeah. that the dangers of going into a two-party system like we see in the in the, to the south of us mm -hmm. so um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you for the person who, who asked. 
um, that is that is the greatest way also. Run for office, put your name. You know, if you don't believe in one, look, in politics is uh, funny how, funny but definitely important, how they define it in a spectrum of right, left, and center. And for some people in the right, the center is not interesting. People in the left, the center is not interesting. But the center is a position where many independent people wants, wants to start being in politics. Independents are very important to our society because they show their desire to be part of the and, and bring their ideas, their vision. Going out to a park, to a city hall, to a hotel to give a speech and tell people, look, I want to be an MLA or I want to be an MP and I want your vote. I want you to work with me. Yeah, what, what are your beliefs? I am not with the liberals, I'm not with the conservatives, I'm not with NDP, whatever the situation is. We have to help them and applaud them. Of course, here comes what we mentioned before. Electoral systems have to have some, some rules. And financing a campaign has certain requirements. They are not always just for the independents. You have to have signatures and you have to have maybe a party supporting your, your, your name. But I congratulate everybody who wants to run and independents are welcome. I hope we have more space for them. Any more? Thanks, Marna. Sean? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a few comments from Mil Mildred in the chat again. Um, there was a question about um, from Lucy, do you think they should have a, a none of the above column when voting. So I think this speaks to spoiled ball balloting and Mildred had a comment, if you vote and spoil your, spoil your vote, you will be recorded as voting. This is good, but if you have no idea, then you can spoil your ballot by choosing more than one choice as well. So yes, you know, yeah. whether you spoil your yeah. vote or, or, or vote for your candidate, it's, you're still voicing your, your preference, right? Right, right. Again, um, we have to have some education you know, educate the electorate about how to do it right. For example, the increase in voting by mail or anticipated voting is wonderful for democracy. Uh, some countries like our neighbor in the South <laughs> doesn't like it very much or didn't like it very much, but here we did. In this election, there was a big number in mail votes. But again, Mildred, you're right. I think it was Mildred that used another person. The electoral system has rules. And one of them is that you have to vote in a way that the person that is counting your vote has certainty of who ha has your choice. When there is a doubt, they don't know what to do, so they annul them or they don't count. But I think it's education, part of it. Fantastic. Thank you, Martin. Um, I don't know. I don't see any more questions here. Um, okay. If anyone else has questions, feel free to throw it in the chat. Um, Marta, thank you so much for this this wonderful presentation today. Um, and I know this this topic is top of mind for Albertans and you know Canadians in general right now. And as it should be, I think you know myself looking at my own um, my own area. We only had an eighteen percent turnout at the at the vote on on Monday, which is very oh. disappointing. Um, so this is, wow. you know, I, I, I completely agree. Everybody needs to go um, make sure they're voting, make sure that your, your voice is being heard. Even if you think the candidate that you want yeah. to vote for isn't going to win, well, if you vote, maybe they will. So, you know, there's exactly. a big difference between 18% yeah. and, and 100%. That's a, that's a, that's a big difference. And, and, and yeah, and let me just close with something else, Star, like the cherry on the pie. Even though we don't interfere with anybody's vote, also take it as part of your work to make people, to invite people to vote. You know, they, don't ask them who they're going to vote for and when, but say, hey, don't miss your vote. Hey, hurry up. I did that in this election with many people. And I, I moved them in a way like, come on, do you want me to take you? I, I can drive you if you want. But make sure that the people get also 
from you the power they have in their hands and invite them to vote. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more, Marta. Okay, wonderful, thank you so much. Um, oh, we have a, another question here that just popped up from Mildred, maybe we can get to it here quick. Um, he asked, yes. can you explain the equalization question? <laughs> okay, yeah, we passed over. Okay, um, I, I because I'm a, a teacher, I like to have a story. Imagine if in a house, um, the mom has salary, the father has salary, the 28 year old son also has money and they all put it together for a home budget. And then the father decides where the money goes. This is for insurance, this is for the cars, and this is for the new um, backyard we're going to build. And this is for vacations in July. But sometimes the son says, come on dad, I'm putting my money and you go on vacation with my mom, but you don't invite me. <laughs> How come I'm putting money and I don't get anything back? You bought a car that is more expensive than mine. How come I'm giving you money, but you're buying a good car for you and I still have my old car. So the same thing happens with the federal government in a way in Canada and in other countries. All the money from the provinces goes to the central government, the federal government. And once the budget is complete, they, those who have more, they have, they have more money or more participation in that budget, they receive according to the needs, but they help more the, the provinces that needed more and they don't have the same income. So it happens with like with the sun. How come federal government, I give you $100 from my work and you're only giving me 20 back? I want to get more uh, feedback from you, from the money I give you. So the West, and this is an old story, we could have a, another hour of discussion. We are rich in energy and oil, and we have given a lot of revenue to the federal government. And some provinces receive more than we do in return. So that's the main issue. Great, thank you so much, Marta. I want to be respectful of everyone's time here. We're we're coming yes. up to one o'clock. So, go back um, to work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Marta. Um, it was wonderful. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone that participated. We'll be sending out the recording after this, and Marta will also be hosting another one later this fall term. I don't recall if we had the date um, confirmed yet, but we'll send out more information about that as well. So about November, November fifteen, around November. November fifteen, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>